Hello and welcome to Talking Gnosticism, our chill, cash, um, <laughs> monthly uh, hangout show where we, you know, just talk about a topic that's at least vaguely related to Gnosticism or is straight up hardcore Gnosticism uh, in a uh, even more fun, even more laid back, even more whatever happens happens than our uh, very strict and professional podcast. Uh, before we actually start, um, I'm going to do a very, 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 very quick commercial, which is patreon.com slash Gnostic. Give us money there. We need it. We can't do the shows without it. Uh, or paypal.com slash Gnostic. Also tell people about the show. Hey, that was fast. Okay, I'll go around. I'll introduce everybody. And um, you can uh, talk a little bit about yourselves and any books you might be pimping and any interest that you may have in Lovecraft, which I hope you have at least a little bit. So uh, <laughs> we'll start with you, Dr. Glenn J. Farron. Oh, Jesus. Um, uh, what, what do you just want? Uh, well, I'm in Oklahoma at the moment. I'm uh, a visiting assistant professor at Oklahoma State University. I just started here August and uh, I'm still melting because uh, it's hot. And apparently there's tarantulas here, which I haven't seen, but I'm a little scared of outside now. Um, yeah, I, I, I have uh, uh, my, uh, my doctorate's on uh, um, early so-called Gnosticism, uh, the writings or lack of writings of Marcion uh, and the Apocrypha of John. I, am, I have been a fan of H.P. Lovecraft since I was a kid. I, I don't know what it was about the monsters, but they freaked the hell out of me uh, to the point where I was showing folks before that I brought my two Cthulhu themed role-playing games as my primary sources, so I'm going to justify these as academic. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Glenn, I know uh, I still haven't made it to SBL, but for, for all the, the uh, biblical studies nerds out there, there apparently are uh, role-playing uh, clubs and nights, so uh, hopefully hopefully, we can all end up at, uh, at the societal, a Society for Biblical Literature conference together, and uh, we can do some tabletop role-playing. Oh, I'm all over that, like, like Cthulhu on a deep one. Yeah, and I was saying to, to Glenn, I've never actually <laughs> never actually played a tabletop role-playing game, and people oh. are shocked by that because they look at me, they assume that I have, and we even have Cult, the tabletop role-playing game, streaming on this channel. Uh, okay, moving on. Dr. David Gooden, throw down. Oh, well, you got to give me a beat if I'm going to rap over it, but in lieu of that, hello, let me introduce first the furry blasphemy. Ah! The, uh, the preferable Lovecraft name for a cat, unlike the one he actually used. Oh, so, yeah. uh, David Gooden, I'm in Montreal, Canada. I teach at McGill and for Laval. I happen to be working. Uh, there's a volume on Lovecraft and theology coming out someday. <laughs> I have an essay within it. Uh, and so you have that to look forward to. What I'm working on right now is a book on theology and the and the filmography of Wes Craven. So nice. if anyone in the audience mm. is interested in a call for papers about Wes Craven and any engagement uh, with theological subtext, subjects, wherever you want to go with that, I'm willing to read that. Um, I'm working on too many things, but I guess that's a brief introduction to me. I know tarantulas where I'm at. So. <laughs> that you know of. Yeah. True, true. I can mail you one if I find one. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Scott R. Jones, returning to the show. I suspect you might have some things to say about Lovecraft. Uh, yeah, I know. I cut my teeth on the fellow way back in the day. But uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm Scott Jones. I'm uh, I'm a I'm a writer. Uh, uh, currently working on my uh, sophomore novel, and uh, I've got a, a collection out and. Of course, the first novel, Stonefish, is out from uh, Word Horde Publishing in the in the states. I myself live in Victoria, Canada. Hello, David, in Montreal. Nice to see you. Uh, always ha always happy to see another Canadian face. <laughs> and uh, yeah, my, one of the one of the first uh, first books I, I wrote was a uh, an examination of Lovecraft's Great Old Ones through the through a. Uh, I want to say a pseudo Gnostic lens. Sure. Basically, instead of instead of viewing them as as uh, you know uh, destructive forces of chaos, you know, I'm like, what can what can we what can we pull from them as we do with any 
deities or or entities, right? What what can we what what can we pull from them when we when we examine their character, when we examine so, some of the you know some of the things they're known for, you know, and if is is it even is it possible to basically build a you know a working spirituality around the great old ones and, a, and around principles of uh, uh, I, I termed it gleeful nihilism, you know, that sort of like mm. there's no meaning fantastic here we go right and s see how far we can take uh uh yeah human spirituality uh through through that lens the book was called when the stars are right and i'm probably never going to live it down when, <laughs> when, when the stars are right towards an authentic relayan spirituality yeah extremely cool extremely cool yeah. and and folks watching and commenting uh i, I am trying to have um gender balance panels or try to have representation. We did have um, um, some uh, some other genders and some women originally sign up, but they had to cancel at the last moment. However, this is the power of HP Lovecraft, who famously found ladies icky and his <laughs> he's just from 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 beyond the grave pushing them away. Oh yes. Yeah. So, you know, this, as I said, this is, this is, uh, 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 it's not a formal interview. I don't have a list of questions, but I guess I should throw it out there. A very obvious one, which is, do you folks think that, that HP Lovecraft's work is, is Gnostic or uh, Glenn for your sake, will do Gnostic? Like, does it have, <laughs> does it have some resonances with the, the thoughts of the, the so-called ancient Gnostics of Gnostic writings? What have you? Anybody at all? Get out there. We're all going to be really polite about this, aren't we? We're all Canadian. Oh, is that say true? no. It'd be interesting. Is say everybody no. Canadian? Uh, yeah, Glenn's Canadian. And yeah, I, I just happen to be stuck in Oklahoma. So yeah. Oh, 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 wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm from yeah. Alberta, so I'm like in the middle of Montreal ah. and Victoria. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. David, are you a dual citizen? Or do you, you yes, are... I am. Okay, yeah, okay. Dual okay. Citizen. Yes. Originally from Miami. Don't hold it against me. Yeah. <laughs> I live in Oklahoma. I hold nothing against anybody. Yeah, that's uh, you beat me there. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't say that. But yeah, who wants to go first on the Gnostic question? Oh my gosh. Well, it kind of depends what you mean by Gnostic, right? Like, yeah. um, I was thinking about this earlier today, uh, uh, and this, this, like, I was thinking of what sort of myth or story in H.P. Lovecraft makes me think of Gnosticism, and I kept thinking of uh, Azatoth. Uh, seems quite reminiscent, like the blind, ignorant God kind of reminds me a little bit of Yatabaloth and uh, uh, the Apocryphon of John, just in sort of their nature. But H.P. Lovecraft strikes me as Gnostic as the way Hans Jonas thought Gnosticism was really just kind of crappy and, and nihilistic and, and vile, right? That was my first thought, that there was no, um, no release, no sort of... Um, a good outcome, which we would get in the, the classic Gnostic, so-called Gnostic text, where in H.P. Lovecraft, you find the demiurge, or lack thereof, go crazy, and that's it. Like, there seems to be this, the, the bad part of the Gnostic myth, for lack of a better word, but none of the positive resolution that, that somebody like uh, Valentinus or uh, Marcion or the Apocrypha John folks would, would say. That was sort of my very first thought, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, spot on. I completely agree. And I, I suspect I didn't do any research before the show because I'd be cheating. But um, you know, Lovecraft was was remarkably well read, perhaps overly too well read. Right. Yeah. And he, um, you know, he, he took in a lot, sometimes uh, often just as table dressing from world mythology, world uh, culture, uh, mythology, uh, of course, other writers. So I, I, I suspect that he was conversant and familiar with what they called Gnosticism and what they knew of Gnosticism at sure. his time, which, of course, would, would just be the heresiologists, right? right? So he's going to have an even more negative opinion of Gnosticism uh, in, a, in a negative interpretation of the Gnostic myth than perhaps uh, some others will. And Glenn, I, I don't think it is a coincidence, you know, that a blind and ignorant God, I'm, you know, he would... I, 
being such a well-read man, someone who is not religious but read a lot about religion and a lot about mythology, probably did come across a description of a description of Sackloss, a description of Yada Bayoff as yeah. blind and ignorant. Like I don't think it's a coincidence or the collective unconscious or or what have you. So so I, I think there probably is a one-to-one -one connection there. But as you pointed out, how, how accurate, you know, quote unquote accurate is this, right? right. Uh, you know, it's a quote unquote a real uh, depiction of Gnosticism. For everybody listening to this instead of watching it there's going to be a lot of air quotes okay just like you know, oh, sorry, a lot of all the time i yeah. really apologize yeah yeah but uh either david or scott what, what do you folks think i have a contrary well not a contrary opinion but i'll sensationalize it a bit of a uh differing opinion please uh, me and my cat apparently wants to <laughs> interject here um I wish I had a chance to really review before I came here, but I believe Randolph Carter in oh. Through the Silver, The Gate of the Silver Key, yeah. he's seeking knowledge. Yeah, he's crazy. seeking forbidden knowledge, and it ends disastrously for him. And so in thinking about the question, there is a Gnostic frame there, but at the end, it's all locked away in that damnable tone, the Necronomicon, with a big warning sign that whatever you think you're going to get from here is not going to be working in your behalf. He has a, a he's equally <laughs> as dangerous, thinks it's equally as dangerous as some of the Christian interlocutors thought back in the day. Yeah. So yeah. it's an interesting engagement. He does admit that universe exists. There is forbidden knowledge to be learned, right. but it's never really successful for the people who pursue it. Yeah. yeah. That's a good point. I forgot. I completely blanked on Randolph, Randolph Carter. <laughs> It's moderately successful for Randolph Carter for a good portion of his journey in, the, in, in those in those two stories, right? Yes. The Silver Key, Through the Gates of the Silver Key, which it, incidentally he did not write alone. Much of the mysticism and uh, you know some of the some of the uh, uh, more more out there concepts for for Lovecraft, you know, the idea that uh, we each of us are a fraction of a hyperdimensional cosmic cone of a particular archetypal being all sorcerers are somehow yog sothoth mm. right who is also umar atawil the uh guardian of the gate you know yog sothoth is the gate and the, and the key and the guardian of the gate all those you know it's the triune thing mm. and so i Personally, I find, yeah, he wrote with E. Hoffman Price, who was very much into Eastern mysticism and no doubt, yeah. uh, no doubt pulled a lot of, uh, a lot of his own knowledge into, into mm. that story. So it does make for an interesting one because you have an example of, you know, here is a Lovecraftian god entity, you know, a horrible, you know, what do they call it? You know, like a, a congeries of globes, you know, viscous psychedelic globes it's not even you know the, m most of his god things don't even have a specific shape you know they're, yeah they're formless and wild uh but you know occasionally if you if you manage to lock them down like randolph carter did in the story then uh, they take on uh beneficial aspects you know until such time as you push through too far <laughs> well, that's but, yeah all. that's absolute absolute constant constant with lovecraft no, yeah, no, like, knowledge has a cost there's incomplete it, knowledge is always bad like when you figure out what exactly is going on that's when you go utterly insane mm. uh, not that it's because you're just incapable of understanding nobody could understand the point um like every I, the best line is like it was unspeakable you know like that kind of lovecraftian trope that is uh, just outstanding yeah yeah, yeah. Huh. Well, you either go insane or you double down and become a cultist. Well, that's true. But they're yeah. usually you're insane. Also they're insane. usually insane. Yeah, yeah. But at least yeah. you're functional. Functionally <laughs> insane. At least you've got a little team. You've got a little group. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's interesting that the insanity part, um, I find like uh, I play a lot of uh, board games. We play a lot of card games. Call of Cthulhu was a card game a friend and I used to play. And uh, you could win it. You could beat Cthulhu. You could beat, you know, uh, Yog Sothoth and all that. <laughs> but when you look at the stories, you look at the role playing game, for instance, it's not about winning. It's about how long you can last before you basically tear your own face off. Like there's this really odd um, nihilism, right? I think as, as somebody mentioned that of, of uh, Lovecraft, that no matter what, it's not going to go well <laughs> for you in some way, shape, or form. 
uh, which there was a story I was thinking, I can't remember what it was, but he would say, and the old ones would come and they would teach us to um, like dance and sing and kill. And I, it's this really weird line. I'm like, yeah, it sounds like fun, but the, oh, that's kind of dark. You know, like there's, there's something joyous about the nihilism. I'd never heard it described like that. I, I I titled my first collection "Shout, Kill, Rebel, Repeat." That was it. That was it. <laughs> that Cthulhu would rise and and teach people new ways to shout and kill and enjoy themselves. Yeah, it's weird that they throw that one on the end. You know, it sounds awful, and then it's like, yeah, but we're also, of course, in my of course in my book, I'm like, well, did he mean that, or did he mean you know just a complete re resetting? You know, w w what's actually being killed in that statement? Yeah, you know, uh, the rational mind. <laughs> yeah, because there is that sense of their, you know, the the old ones and and all the sort of powers to be are are so uh, beyond us that their rationalizations are were it's incomprehensible. Like, of course, yeah. they would revel and kill and laugh because that is what they do. We just it's our lack in a way that is uh, why they uh, uh, need to teach us that. I guess I, I'm not really sure. I have to think about that now. The Darwinian beast has forgotten how to bite in polite public to channel Nietzsche for a second. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, Lovecraft is writing in the wake of the death of Nietzsche. Yes. Um, yeah. So there's obviously, I think, echoes of this, you know, freeing humanity from its shackles to see what it could become and not to be afraid of it mm -hmm. because there might be monsters like this, but it might reveal something about your true destiny too. It's true. Right. Yeah, I, I think that is definitely an influence and something that he, in a roundabout way that, that he's getting to or at least wants to get to, right? It's to, because he was, of course, so proper and repressed. But, you know, he wasn't a dumb guy. He can see this stuff in his own work, I hope. But but I think I think you're right, David. Is like He, he craves um, to become monstrous. And he craves for a a monstrous humanity in my psychoanalytic, you know, reading of his work. Sure. Right. That kind of Nietzschean liberation, where the only choice you have is to become a monster, right? Because that is the truth of existence, uh, post Darwin, post the death of God, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when God is dead, basically, you know, the um, the great old ones are the maggots eating his his corpse. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> Uh, but but going back to uh, to, to stuff that, that both David and, and Scott was saying, you know that is a Gnostic theme: it's a search for transcendent knowledge, right? Ascent, and and having knowledge of the entire working universe. So it's very interesting that you phrase it in that way. And, and you know, I don't find it in a lot of Nag Hammadi texts. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, and maybe Glenn, you can you can correct me. But in the kind of wider. Uh, Jewish and Christian and and others uh, mystical traditions. There's always all these warnings about if you're not careful of the stuff w of pursuing gnosis, you'll go crazy. Right. Right. You know, four four rabbis entered paradise. Yes. <laughs> um, no. Yeah. In Merkaba, yeah. like this is a very common common thing in the tradition. Right. Is, is, to, is, is that the same as when they say now that you're forty, you can begin to study Kabbalah? <laughs> I think there's something it? on uh, there. I, yeah. Yeah, I remember reading something about like, yeah, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. Started, you, you, you got you got to wait till you're like locked in a little bit before right, before right. going in there, because otherwise it will disorient. That's it. Why well, I think you're supposed to have a you know a grounding of stability so that yeah. that your brain can can understand these things. And you know, again, for another sort of cross cultural religious comparison would be Vajrayana Buddhism, where they mm. they really make you do a lot of uh, basic meditation for years and years and years. Right, basically the. The um, you can't do Kabbalah to your forty, uh, and then when you're older and you've done all this meditation, then they do sort of funkier practices and they reveal quote unquote the truth of the universe to you, and they're like, if we told this to you earlier, you would go insane. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that is a very interesting parallel with uh, Lovecraft, but of course with Lovecraft, uh, you know these traditions do talk about if you want to have gnosis of the universe, insanity is a very realistic danger and side effect. But with Lovecraft, it, it, you, it's the only answer, right? You go insane, you go die, you die, or you become an insane uh, cultist. So that that's where he would uh, uh, differ from uh, uh, from some of the mystics. Yeah. He, he would shift over though in his career toward towards the end 
I mean, he was a horror writer. We must remember yeah. this, right? I mean, he was he was obviously going for the scare in his in his own fashion, but you can see him beginning to humanize his monsters later on in his career. By the time you get to at the Mountains of Madness, he's basically referencing the elder things, you know, who are like star-headed, crinoid, you know, barrel-shaped, hexagonal, with tentacles for motion on the on the foot pads wings for interstellar and he's calling them but they were a certain kind of men yeah they were a certain yeah. kind of men and they had nobility mm -hmm. and he recognizes it i mean with creatures he's made up himself but at the same time he's starting to see this like oh well there may be there may be more to this consciousness and awareness thing than than just than just what we we have as humans and uh he, he starts he starts giving his monsters a little more uh a little more uh, airtime, really, as as well, maybe not decent people, but people. Yeah. Right? <laughs> uh, they are. They have their own reasonable agendas in some ways, like the uh, like the star headed. I, I forget their names, but they felt like like worthy protagonists in the story or antagonists, I guess. Uh, in the mountains of madness um, yeah. yeah they were doing autopsies on things they found the same things the humans yeah, are doing yeah, yeah. i almost detect like a working thesis which might be entirely wrong that's why i say a working thesis mm -hmm. he's contrasting ontology and biology because um, there's is this this discourse of physical degeneration biologically and evolutionary but mm -hmm. the elder things at the mountains of madness are a higher being Yes. So rational, he very much has a rational ontology, which is approached in Gnostic type ways. Mm -hmm. But he also is contrasting that with what's happening to humankind, which he sees as a physiological degeneration. And so very much as a contrast of there is acknowledgement of other beings as just inhuman existences, the beyond one, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, you know, that is inhuman, but still... It's more of the uncanny rather than the body horror of physical degeneration. He's playing with certain themes that are quite interesting. Yeah. I mean, he's weird. Well, not weird. I mean, uh, the, the 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 overt racist stuff that you have in his in his writings, where he talks about the mongrel hordes, and he's referring to anybody of color. Um, where then you look at the the folks in the or the the monsters in the mountains of madness. They had their own sort of mongrel whore god just, just <laughs> hard to say it right yeah yeah but they were like there was this weird notion of purity that he was going for that there was yeah. this fear of this degeneration as as david was saying um and uh, i mean his uh, i watched a, a documentary on him and when he moved to new york his utter terror of like look at these people they're not as white as me you know like there was this real uh utter um fear of that like uh they like normally we think of him as a i always think of him as fear of unknown but it was the fear of the other which was also a big part of, i found of, of lovecraft but that might have been more him than his stories perhaps. and to underscore these points the elder things at the mountain of madness are usurped by a subservient class of beings called the shoggoths yeah. originally slaves but they rose up yeah. and just barbarically beheads them and so it's almost a tragic story of what happened to a great civilization that degenerated. It almost yeah. becomes a parable, uh, you know, working with his uh, fear of the other, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, hampers a little bit of his legacy, though. I think he's been received much more as a spiritual, uh, speaking about spiritual degeneration more so than just physiological, though mm -hmm. that's actually how he expressed it in his text. There's no way around that. Yeah. Well, and he was, I mean, that sort of idea, I mean, I think he was an extreme example even of his time, but he was still of his time, you know, like, like you can't pull him uh, out of his context and say, yeah, he was racist. Like, yeah, he was, but 85% of people were uh, in the, in, maybe not to the same vitriol that he had, but nonetheless, he, he does seem, you know, without being an apologist, he, you know, you can't uh, uh, um, uh, burn him for that. But yeah, there is that. I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, without lessening the, the importance of recognizing and 
and mm -hmm. grappling with his racism. There is something a little bit funny, a little bit ironic uh, about a horror writer who would get terrified by seeing an Italian. Right? Yeah. I had to go run and hide and cry. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. the, 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 that often comes through in the discourse as, as you know, uh, what was the story I heard? It, it, it wasn't just that when he was living in New York, he was, gosh, look at all these colored people. You know, he was literally terrified. Yeah. Yes. You know, he would cross the street. He would make outbursts. You know, uh, he would make it in in uh, in the letters to his friends and uh, you know, uh, uh, discussions amongst his peers about how's how's old Howie doing in New York? Yeah, not so good. Yeah. <laughs> right. And he didn't. He had to. You know, he had. To, he he re, he retreated. You know, he, yeah. he pulled he pulled back from that black sea of infinity that stretched before him, and he was like, "Can't do it. Yeah. I'll write about it, but I can't do it." Was it the, the horror Red Hook? Is that the one? The horror Red Hook. Is, yeah, oh, hugely, hugely, uh, hugely problematic. The, the as, fear as of the writer is so powerful. <laughs> like he is way more scared of the Italian than he yeah. is of, <laughs> of Azazoth, right? Or, or you know, like there's something. And when I think about it like that, it's that's kind of funny <laughs> in some ways. You know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I might do a, a whole show on it, but I highly recommend Alan Moore's uh, uh, Corpus on 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 Lovecraft. So his his Providence uh, uh, series or uh, whatever he calls it. Um, but it's it, it's rather excellent and grapples with some of these these topics. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. That's sometimes a tough read. We should mention. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's a that's a that that that. Uh, Neonomicon and that whole Providence series is uh, oh, okay. that's a that's a rough read sometimes. Mm, there's yeah. some, there's some there's some elements in there. <laughs> has anybody read Lovecraft and Carter? I can't remember the author, but it's uh, um, like an alternative history where Lovecraft and Carter are were real. Carter was a real world figure, and they figure out their stories are actually what happened. And Carter's son and Lovecraft's African American granddaughter. Go on adventures, nice. <laughs> which okay. are amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is such a, like okay. it, one of the books that that's an alternative World War II had happened, and the Nazis were still in play, and the N word was Nazi, right? So this this whole weird, mm. you know, mm. it's I read it such a while. Oh, I should have looked at that before I came to. <laughs> Damn. Do you have an author name for us, Glenn? Uh, you know what? I'm, know. Look, I have it on my Goodreads. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I can find it. But, yeah, I can put yeah, it in the show good. notes too. Yeah. Oh yeah, they were. Uh, uh, let's see if I can find it quick. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Howard. That's that sounds like a that sounds like a Peter Rollick kind of kind of story. He's a very prolific current author. Jonathan Howard. Yeah, uh, Carter and Lovecraft, the novel. Neat. Uh, there's two of them. Uh, the sequel I thought was was better. Uh, and I love the little sly little uh, poke that his his uh, granddaughter happened to be uh, a woman of color. That just that was just great. Like I just I had a I had a very warm moment when I read that. You know, there does seem to be that element in fiction where there people are reinterpreting Lovecraft via his his sort of the, the racism. Uh, Lovecraft Country comes to mind. Yeah. Um, the, the what's the one the the, the story about the tides. Um, Oh, what the hell! Winter Tide. Winter Tide. Yeah. Winter Tide by uh, Ruthanna Emrys. Yeah. Yeah. I, I yeah. Actually, uh, I actually uh, uh, bought one of her uh, bought one of her Innsmouth stories for an anthology I uh, I put together a couple of years ago. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and uh, no, she, but that's happening a lot. I mean, that's practically yeah. my whole that's practically my whole career. Sure. You know, sure. Uh, re 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 examining Lovecraft through through a more modern lens. Yeah. Yeah, because we're all kind of we're all kind of tired of uh, of uh, you know um, uh, tweedy academics losing their minds at the slightest indication that they might not have uh, a true grasp on things. Yeah. <laughs> that's what drew me to Lovecraft. <laughs> I mean, that's what yeah, draws us all. I can relate to that. Us all. <laughs> I would say academics fight so hard because so little's at stake. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Um, but yeah, why well, I, I there is this interesting, like there's almost a a, a not uh, a new interpretation or a reinterpretation of the Lovecraft mythology, much like you know, um, Apocrypha of John is a reinterpretation of Genesis, 
we are getting this reinterpretation of Lovecraft and kind of spinning him in this uh, other light, uh, kind of framing it in a different way. Not not in the same results, of course, but there does seem to be this investment in reapplying him in some way and, and his work uh, and finding a, a different unintentional meaning, I think. I think there's th that, that's how I've always thought of uh, Lovecraft, because when I encountered him, he was just some schlock who had creepy covers, and I could only find his books in a used bookstore. I didn't know what I was reading, and I, I, I just thought, this is bizarre. And then now it's become this literary thing, which I'm really surprised at in some ways. Yeah. It's, it's, oh, sorry to interrupt. It's really great you brought that up, Glenn, because that, that was exactly what I, I wanted to introduce or talk about next is, is, you know, Lovecraft was not a huge success when he was alive, right? Yeah. And he, um, um, Oh, you can you can jump in, Scott. That might be a bit of a an over yeah. uh, a bit no, of a no, cliche, but no, he 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 died penniless and yeah. alone. Yeah. Yep. You know, so it, it never really came together for him. It wasn't until his his buds after the fact, yeah. You know, basically uh, basically uh, pushed for. Uh, well, they kept him in. They kept him in print. That was the Arkham House uh, imprint. Arkham House, yes. Yeah, Arkham House and uh, and uh, August Derleth, our old old Augie. Yeah, you know, they kept them in print through the '50s and into the '60s, and by that time, the new wave of uh, you know uh, UK horror writers and uh, weird fiction writers from the states, you know, were all who had been part of the Lovecraft circle way back in the day, you know, were like, well, now we can get the ball rolling here, and yeah. it just kept it just kept rolling. So weird in the background. Yeah. So that Glenn didn't notice it until recently. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but it's yeah, but it's been, it's been a, it's been a long, it's been a long haul where yeah. uh, it's just been, it's just been fans in the background really keeping it alive for, until now. But yeah. I also think well, it's not a coincidence that no. according to the Arkham House website, I mean, it touches on some of the research I did. That's why I have it at my fingertips. The backlog of everything that they had previously you know, produced of his works, started to sell by 1943, sold out by 1944. There you go. So something about the World yeah. War II context, suddenly his works resonated. Yeah. And that I find fascinating. So like my particular research head toward the Odyssey and rejection of Christian narratives of there's a plan. There's a plan to why the world the way it is. Yeah. And it became nonsense. He wrote after World War I, and he gained an audience during and after World War II. People started questioning, is the universe under a rational providence of a God who cares about us, or were human th beings just created as a joke or a jest or a mistake? Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. suddenly that that hit home. Yeah, that I never really made that connection. It, it made me think of... Um, Post World War One, where uh, the Book of Revelation became Christian theology again. Before that, it was sort of an embarrassment, right? We wrote this, you know, and then, oh, maybe we do suck, you know, or something. And and that, I mean, what you just said about Lovecraft is that's definitely dead on. Huh? Interesting, David. I don't know if you've uh, if you've found this yet, but uh, I believe during the latter year, the the, the last couple of years of World War Two. Uh, the American military included little books with their GI packs, you know, just something to read while you're at the front. They included and you, Lovecraft and apparently, behind enemy lines apparent, here. Apparent, read. Apparently, he Sleep got a, well? a, 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 a few of his stories got, got into these little, these little, uh, these little with, readers for well, the Well, it kind of makes sense that often, like, the Germans of World War One are seen as the bad guys. Yeah. You know, How and, and, the baddies? Are we the baddies? <laughs> Pure <laughs> yeah. coincidence there. Um, but that's uh, interesting uh, that uh, if it mm. got into care packages to troops overseas. I just see the troops then running towards <laughs> the mortar fire after reading their Lovecraft short stories. <laughs> like, it has no point. It's all madness. Take me. I, I can't imagine how Lovecraft would inspire me to fight. <laughs> like, like, I honestly think... The first, the, I can't remember the story. It was just a short fragment where he was taught uh, the, this. Um, there was a train, and the conductor came out, and his head was like a tentacle, and made this bang sound. I remember reading it out on my deck, and it was fall, and the leaves were, sh you know, shuttling around. 
I was scared silly. Like I had, I just, that's it, I'm out. And I and I had to go. And so I can imagine a, a soldier, you know, up his neck and death is like, okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe in that context, it felt like light reading. Given Suddenly machine reading. guns and mortars weren't an issue. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was it. <laughs> that is so weird. I had, that, that doesn't, I have to think on that. Don't one. absolutely quote me on it, but I'll double check for you, fellas. Oh, I am going to quote you. I'll, 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 I'll see about that. <laughs> oh, but it, it's funny the um, how that uh, mythology uh, evolved. Uh, it was it was worth I mean, discussing it. I think I first encountered H.P. Lovecraft in an old uh, Dungeons and Dragons monster manual, uh, Deities and Demi's Gods. That was it. Mm -hmm. They had Cthulhu myth mythos as okay. folks you could you could fight with. And um, I mean, you weren't going to win, but there was this, there was something so unreal about them compared to all the other sort of things that you'd have, say, with Dungeons and Dragons and, and things like that. But uh, uh, it's funny how he, it did seem to have this ebb and flow, right? Like he died penniless, but then it would come up and then seem to fade out. And, and now he's got a, uh, like an American literature collection, I think. Um, I've seen that there are black hardcover that are you know, yeah. central. Like, that's amazing to me that he went from this weird, like it was never a clear trajectory. It was always this uh, up and down kind of thing. Um, yeah. I wish they could make a good movie on his stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. that's actually what I what I wanted to uh, to talk about is, okay, so, you know, I grew up in a pretty small place and, um uh, you know, finding uh, paperbacks, uh, I didn't, whatever the bookstore had in the sci-fi and horror is, is what I was reading, right, or in the library system. So I remember I actually found Clark Ashton Smith first. But, um, like, Lovecraft was obscure when he was alive, and then he did have these resurgences, as we've been talking about, these ebbs and flows, and that's sort of some popularity in the 60s, I am to understand. But I, I would propose, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, he didn't really break until the 2000s, very yeah. late 90s, early 2000s. But you can find him a lot in, in the work of people who are inspired by him and by nerds and in pop culture. Like, I would say there's a, a big Lovecraft influence on the first uh um ghostbusters movie right oh for sure um oh, yeah. The, uh, yeah i i basically found out about lovecraft because of stephen king the um uh, children of the corn uh the original uh, salem's lot uh jerusalem's yeah. lot uh is jerusalem slot is just a, a straight straight ripoff of of hp lovecraft uh same thing with some other works you know and king of course in its own writing acknowledges his debt to sure. to yeah. lovecraft so that was really my first exposure to him and i feel like a lot of artists and uh, a lot of creators of of sort of nerdier stuff, nerdier artists, uh, genre fiction, uh, we'll call it that, yeah. would, because Lovecraft wasn't that well-known but was well-known enough, they would put in a lot of sly references that could be really fun or have a figure that was like a Lovecraft figure. And really that, so still a very important part of um, genre fiction and a big influence on creators and movies that we all love, but but I feel like it was still pretty obscure until 2000. And then all of a sudden I feel like there's just tons of Lovecraft shirts and, you know, vote for Cthulhu for uh, president, uh, literal, uh, Cthulhu uh, uh, stuffy uh, toys, um, a lot more parodies, a lot more comics. So the early 2000s really goes from this niche thing to this, rel I'll just actually, I shouldn't say relatively mainstream, to this mainstream thing. So why do you folks think that there was this, this inbreaking into our reality uh, of all this yeah. Lovecraft stuff after so many decades? Like why why two thousand and still big to now, right? You know, Lovecraft Country, which somebody brought up, that was a a yeah. huge TV show, right? We're talking enormous budget and enormous cultural impact. So the last twenty years has really seen has really been the the age of Cthulhu. So if if anybody wants to to speak to that or has any theories, well, I'll introduce it and then invite the uh, the other two guests to correct me. Um. I think the word discussion has to start is Lovecraft's mastery at world building and mm -hmm. how he connects his mm -hmm. stories and how they reappear. And Wizard Watley will come back. And this enabled him to be borrowed. I mean, Arkham is now a place. You know, the Joker would yeah. do, uh, get in this. <laughs> the thing from 1982, the world building allowed it to feed in on itself. Yeah. But why the year 2000? 
what helped with my introduction to Lovecraft being an academic, I have to read professionally. When I want to read recreationally, YouTube with audiobooks has been my savior. And Lovecraft <laughs> with a great narrator, someone to read Lovecraft well, he becomes alive in a new way. Yeah. I encourage everyone listening yeah. to this, find Lovecraft on YouTube, the audiobooks. Yeah. A whole new reality of Lovecraft will come out to you. Shadow of Ismuth will have your heart in your throat mm -hmm. when they're fiddling with the doors. And it's the prose that Lovecraft created is so elaborate, it really needs to be spoken to, to come alive. Yeah. Reading that is difficult, to, challenging. The, the audio of the doom that came to Sarnath is, uh, uh, and the old gods, I think, or the other gods or something. Those two are just the narration. Um, yeah. I have the audible. I'm not sure it's a collection of Lovecraft stuff. But yeah, there is something about hearing it yeah. as opposed to reading it, which is actually really interesting when I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I, I, I would absolutely agree with you, David. I uh, I actually figured this out sort of intuitively back in, in 1997. I was a, I was uh, living in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and I had just escaped the cult I'd been indoctrinated and grown up in. Uh, and I was doing, I got involved with community radio at CFCR 90.5 FM in Saskatoon. And I basically did old school, I would read weird fiction. It was a late night, late night on a Saturday at midnight. Perfect for, you know, the oh, Saskatoon cool. party crowd to the nerds to tune in. It's like, oh, there's that guy on the radio reading Lovecraft again. And I would do whole stories. I would do whole stories and play an old radio drama and maybe a little music here and there. But that was the deal. And, you know, I, that that show was like the top program three years running for 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 that for that station. Uh, because I think of the reading, because of the, because of that, hmm, it's, I don't want to, I don't want to use the word Baroque, but it has that, it has that quality of, of, he throws so many adjectives on it. It becomes yeah. almost meaningless, but also by, by accumulating, you know, all that language around it, you begin to get a sense of what he's really talking about. Yeah. You know, he's, he'll say this, this creature was indescribable. I have no words for it, but then he'll throw like 300 words at it. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. And somehow through, through the, through the lattice work of the language, you pick up the horror of what he's trying, trying to get at. So yeah, spoken is best. I think. What year were you uh, doing the uh, radio broadcast? 97 through, through 2000. Okay. I was in Saskatoon up until night late. Early '97, I think. So, oh, no kidding. I wonder if I oh, caught, I caught that. Maybe. Yeah, that's funny. I was really, I was really obvious about it too. Is the show was just called Weird Tales. That's it. Oh, that's, I tales. used to work graveyards <laughs> at a group home, and I used to listen to the radio all the time. Yeah. Else to do, I bet you I listened to that. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny. If you did, that'd be great. Yeah. No. Yeah. Been, well, if I heard about it, it would have been all over it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This sounds, I mean, all these nice, like really eloquent and, and uh, great sort of reasonings why Lovecraft became popular. Could it be that it just went into the public domain? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That has, yeah. I mean, it's easy like to publish now. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, I was thinking about a D and D supplement. Uh, it was called like deities and demigods. The first printing of uh, how to be withdrawn because they didn't have copyright. Uh, you can, and it's like a huge collector copy, like if D&D &D nerds get it, it's great. But now uh, I think the Lovecraft stuff has become part of the public domain. So you can't swing a dead cat in a game store without hitting some supplements of HP Lovecraft or Cthulhu or any of those kinds of things. So I wonder if that might have contributed to it as well. Um, I hope not. In a way, I like this. The other narratives are so much better. Um, but it's, I know at least in the nerd gaming circle, it's sort of a running joke that games are either about, you know, trading in the Mediterranean or Cthulhu and that's it. Like that's the two themes that you get. And I'm sure it's all the, you know, I'm sure it's many factors, right? Oh, okay. So I'm sure it's not just a public domain, but I sure hope not. Yeah. Can we just say 
it Cthulhu is when it's Cthulhu time, and the two thousands was was ripe. I mean, right, right. time. Right around Y2K, people were freaking out. I mean, why not? I mean, there's something existential about that period that was uh, utterly terrifying, you know? Yeah, precisely. As well as all the, the issues around religion, too, and religion changing and the continuation of, you know, apparently God had been dead for a while by the year 2000, but people are still <laughs> grappling with that. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Uh, this is neither here nor there, but, but feel free to comment it or not, because um, I'm somebody, and, and Scott or all three of you might already know this, but I'm somebody who, who's very interested in the origins of, of interesting ideas and sometimes where they mutate and go. So are any of you familiar with theosophy? It yes. is... Okay, it is yeah. proven that HP... Okay, so uh, I guess I better say, people who watch this show <laughs> probably know what theosophy is, okay? But to make a long story short, it's an incredibly um, um, influential uh, religious spiritual movement from the turn of the 19th century that spills out into the 20th century. And it, if you met someone on the street, you're trying to describe to someone, it's basically new age thought. It's much more complicated than that, but it's sort of a new age uh, lodge system uh, based in, in the Anglosphere, but then spreads all around the world. And a lot of important people like it. A lot of important people sign up for it. It's very influential. Yeah. And we'll be talking about it more on the show uh, because I really think it's the most dramatic. It's had the most dramatic impact on religion since the Protestant Reformation. Doesn't mean that I like it. There's lots of issues I don't like in uh, <laughs> theosophy. But for, for influence-wise, I would say as important as the, the Protestant Reformation. Anyways, it is proven, people have done research, that, that he was reading theosophical texts. And they have a, an elaborate mythology about previous races, lost races, Lemuria, Atlantia, space gods. Sure. So, you know, he, he, of course, they're all much more positive uh, uh, in their depictions than, um, uh, than what's in Lovecraft, but it's an influence. And if somebody wants to see that illustrated and come together, it's in uh, the Hellboy comic book series. Um, oh, they, sure. yeah, so so the, the creator of Hellboy uh deliberately combines the mythologies of uh of Lovecraft and Theosophy into a cohesive whole, even though there's already that connection there, so that's why it's easy to do. But he makes it much more explicit and then he connects the two and has direct references between the two of them. So that I just thought that was really cool. And then, as I said, just again, that this kooky spiritual movement from the uh the, the end of the uh the, the 19th century, um, uh. Uh, has uh, has hit again with with another impact. Mm. Now, for ideas mutating, th this is something that I think is very interesting. Uh, an influence on ancient aliens. Yes, absolutely. the ancient alien writers absolutely. were all reading Lovecraft. Yeah. 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 So when you when you turn on the History Channel, so for the people listening, <laughs> there's the air quotes again. <laughs> there's there's do you, if you turn it on right now. There's a there's nine out of ten chance there's going to be some sort of ancient alien programming talking to us about how aliens uh, built the pyramids or some nonsense like sure. that. And that's you can make a one to one from those conspiracy books of uh, the chariots of the gods and, uh, and yeah. such that came out in the fifties and sixties to Lovecraft. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, just putting that out there because I think those are those are uh, two cool things and two two more secrets. Uh, uh, influences uh, on, on very influential pop culture and sometimes, unfortunately, not pop culture. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. Does, does anybody know if uh, HP was uh, interested in, like, Helena Blavatsky and the Theosophical Society? Because I keep okay. thinking of... He read, yeah. he'd re he'd read he, The Secret Doctrine. He read The Secret yeah, Doctrine. Yeah. He yeah. must have. I, had, I never yeah. really thought of it, but, yeah, he, um, he must have because... All of her, like her basic stuff is pretty, you know, like the Great White Brotherhood and all that stuff is fine and good, but her kind of deep dive, uh, I could just see Lovecraft, mm, just loving that, even though she was a lady. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've been going for almost an hour. Uh, the time flies. Um, so, so maybe we will start to get into wrap up. And then, you know, uh, I can do a whole show just on HP Lovecraft and sex. So I won't wrap up with that because that's a whole that that's a whole kettle of undescribable squid monster. Oh, that, that's the biggest uh, 
That's like the anti-aphrodisiac right there. It's Max and H.P. Lovecraft. Like, <laughs> well, now, guys, I just want to. <laughs> have Have you read? Uh, have you heard of uh, the researcher uh, Bobby Derry? No, no, no. Uh, Robert Derry. He's uh, oh, what, what state is he out of? I do. I can't recall just right now. But his uh, his wonderful uh, wonderful book, Sex and the Cthulhu Mythos, okay. uh, in which he basically it's it is if you it's a remarkable piece of uh, piece of research. He is a he is a uh, uh, I've, I've yeah it's uh, let me pull let me pull it up for you here. Please. See if I can find it. It's so good. If if you if you haven't read it, I recommend you do. Here, let me see if I can find the ebook here. Uh, but yeah, he basically goes into, you know, Lovecraft was this seemingly asexual being, but let's actually examine what we know from his from his letters, you know, from his relationships, uh, how he wrote about women, how he wrote about sex. Uh, and then of course, what's between the lines? Because yeah. there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of nameless rights. There's your air quotes. You know, nameless rights and blasphemous, uh, blasphemous activities uh, that he that he references. You know, uh, by by cultists usually. Sure. You know, they, they were found in the woods doing something awful. Gosh, wonder what? <laughs> what yeah. could that have been? <laughs> I, I just found the cover of the book. And, um, yeah, I'm going to order this as soon as I can. Order up, order up. It's an amazing <laughs> bit of research, and he goes <laughs> into. The cover's Every, hilarious. Right? <laughs> he, he, he even digs up the first, uh, you know, shout out to Bobby here, but he even dug up the first 70s era uh, parody uh, porn film. Okay, we've reached that point in the evening. Yeah, yeah. we've reached it. It's the hentai moment. It's that the jazz moment. goes with uh, Cthulhu, yeah. I wonder. <laughs> well, I mean, who knew it would go there? But I, HB, I the Jay-Z of the early 1920s. But you, want to talk about, you, want to, you want to talk about Cthulhu and, and Lovecraft infecting popular culture. I mean, you got to look at the trash stratum. That's what Philip K. Dick tells us, right? Yeah. It's for it's research, so honey. Much, I have to watch research. this form. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's good stuff. Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, well this is this is actually the perfect ending. Thank you, Scott. And, and all all it's jokes awesome. aside, all jokes aside, I am going to get it, and I will, I guess, for research, watch the porn because this is definitely. I'll definitely want to to interview this uh, uh, the, uh, this writer. So uh, I'll want to have uh, all of that uh, uh, um, material uh, uh, on hand. Um, I'll, put you I'll, I'll, I'll put you in touch, John. <laughs> That'll be amazing, <laughs> guys. Thanks so much. Happy Halloween! It's been so much fun. Um, uh, I this will also be archived on YouTube, it'll go up uh, on YouTube in a, in a day or two. Uh, so I'll send you guys copies, you can listen to it, you can share it. And we'll, we'll mm -hmm. for, for people watching right now who are watching live or people who are listening or watching, I am going to put all the plugs in the show notes. So look down below on your podcatcher or on YouTube and check out uh, Glenn's great work, check out David's great work, check out Scott's great work, buy their books, buy multiple copies of their books. Uh, and <laughs> And I, I suspect uh, we'll be talking to all of you again in the future. So thanks so much. It was nice meeting you guys. Thank you. Thanks, thanks again. Nice to meet you, Glenn. Thank you.